we've been working to deploy it in Ireland for the last four months. As, as Davy mentioned, um, we have a great, a great crew of committed individuals from uh, Cultivate, uh, from the Transition Towns Network, involved in the Community Supported Agriculture Network, um, and involved in the Dublin Food Co-op, among other initiatives. Um, we're almost ready to deploy it, as, as Davy said. Uh, the only mark on the map at the moment is my fledgling food hub here in Newbridge, which we haven't yet launched, but will do as soon as I come back from my holidays in Leitrim. <laughs> The, the, the food markets and, and the physical uh, ecosystem online and into the into that market space so otherwise we're going to we're going to simply just lose lose market space and, and not be able to compete with the with the larger um, the larger entities so OFN it's a low cost flexible route to market um, I'll go through the the pricing uh, model in a few minutes um, it also allows producers to collaborate uh, because of the variety of shop fronts that it, it facilitates. Um, producers can collaborate in many different ways. They can sell directly themselves or they can sell through local hubs and collaborate with other local producers. And it allows consumers to see what local producers are out there by accessing the map. Um, and OFN is different from other platforms that are out there on the market at the moment. Um, because of the range of functionality that it offers, it's really not prescriptive about how you, how you use it. You can, you can use it as a, a producer and you can set up as a, a, simply your shop pro, profile, or you can set up your shop front directly as an individual, or you can set up a food hub, a cooperative food hub, or a, an, a virtual online market. So, you know, some of the other platforms that are out there are very, very defined and quite specific about how they, how they operate and it's really great to see them it's wonderful that that the variety of offering is there but um I, i'm attracted to ofn because of the, the flexibility that the, the platform offers um another point of difference i think is is certainly the pricing the pricing model um at the moment the the pricing the indicative pricing model that we're looking at would allow a producer to set up their profile free on the on the map so they can have their their producer listing free of charge. Um, the basic plan then is a one euro per month minimum donation of, for trading of up to 500 euros monthly. Um, the starter plan then at the next level is 2% of sales for trading of up to 3,500 per month. And then beyond 3,500 euros per month trading volume, we would offer a tiered, um, a tiered or scaled costing. Um, so that I mean that compares very very competitively to to other platforms that are out there on the market, and you know sure if you're running a hub you may have other uh, overheads that you would obviously have to factor in if you have an online payment system there will be charges associated, but OFN allows you to um, set up your own cost model locally in your hub or at your market to accommodate those those uh, local realities, um, so that. That principle of, of subsidiarity is also um, very much um, a key value of the Open Food Network. Um, and in terms of my own values and, and I think the, the values of, of a lot of people in the, in the uh, local food ecosystem, um, it's nice to be able to, to make your own decisions and define things that, in a way that answers the, the challenges of your own individual community. Um, so the, the ownership model is also obviously something that, that is, is particularly interesting about OFN. Sam will go into it in a little bit more detail, but, um, you know, for me, if you are, you know, one of the huge motivating factors of running the market in the first place was to try and address the difficulties within the, the, the local food uh, system and, and access and all of that and for me it's really important that the systems and platforms that I would use are also contributing to that fairer food system which which OFN certainly is doing um, as an open source not-for-profit uh, platform um, so you know just having been involved for the last four months with the with the OFN community both nationally and internationally it's been a very very positive um, experience and I am very um, hopeful and optimistic for what we can achieve with OFN here in Ireland going forward. So thanks very much.
Thanks, Yvonne. That was brilliant. Silent applause. It's hard on Zoom to get that appreciation, but you covered so much there. Uh, remember to use the chat. We're capturing questions and insights. We might not get them to, to them tonight, but be very useful. Uh, especially insights of where you see my, where you see connections or how we might accelerate this. So just to um, give a, a little bit of an introduction of what we mean with 21st century cooperativism, if you could say the word, platform cooperatives and solidarity co-ops, uh, which we hope OFN will be an amazing example of in Ireland. Uh, Sam Toland, Sam, do you want to just give us a little uh, introduction to what we mean by that? Yeah, well, I'll just kind of maybe briefly speak to the cooperative dimension more generally with OFN and then come to that. Uh, so the idea of a co-op came up quite early in the conversation because as, as Davey kind of mentioned, a few of us had experience working within cooperatives and had seen the impact that can be had through that model and were part of the kind of wider kind of cooperative platform cooperative movement internationally. And we brought these conversations to the, the group that were discussing whether we could actually bring OFN into Ireland or not. It became clear to the group that the cooperative model really mapped quite well onto the values and principles that underpinned the OFN. You know, value, they're open, democratically organized, and they're uh, distributive by design, both in terms of control and uh, kind of profit and surplus. Um, when it came down to thinking about how to bring the cooperative model to OFN, the, the multi-stakeholder nature of OFN kind of led us down this road of looking at the solidarity cooperative model, which has been adopted by many progressive uh, kind of purpose-driven cooperatives in the 21st century. And the, the, the solidarity cooperative in a nutshell is a cooperative that brings together all of the stakeholders in the kind of governance structures of the co-op. And in this case, obviously, it's consumers, producers, workers, and even the wider community. And these solidarity cooperatives are embedded within this wider platform cooperative movement, which is made up of founders, entrepreneurs, activists, and policymakers, which are seeking to, I suppose, kind of provide a, an alternative model to the extractive monopolies that have taken over much of the digital economy in the last 20 years. You know, these are companies that have kind of gone from nothing to basically controlling huge aspects of our lives, not just as users of services, but even those of us running small enterprises where we're basically dependent on platforms that we have very little say over, uh, very little control, and that they can make life-changing decisions that impact on our life without so much as really considering our needs. So I was just basically speaking to, uh, you know, the platform co-op movement offering an alternative to the extractive monopolies that have taken over the digital economy in recent years. And this OFN Ireland is a great tangible example of an enterprise that is placing control in the hands of users and not distant shareholders. So Brilliant. I hope that gives a bit of context. So community driven, community led, uh, community owned uh, is what we're looking at. and. Uh, OFN, though, across the world in different iterations, use different uh, structures and legal structures to protect the integrity of, of the platform. So one of the, the, the people that we've been uh, most inspired with is Nick Weir, who uh, was one of the presenters at the Feeding Ourselves conference uh, where we would discuss OFN just the week before the lockdown. Uh, Nick is a founding member of the Stroud Community Agriculture CSA and the Stroud Co. Food Hub, which has been a big inspiration to what we're trying to do in the Eco Village. And he gave that um, presentation remotely. He's going to give us 15 minutes and show us, uh, he's going to share his screen and show us uh, the, the platform and how it can be used. So welcome, Nick. Thank you, Davey. And hello, everybody. Really nice to be working with you. And um, if my capacity here today, as well as what David just said, um, I'm here in my capacity as a global gardener. I'm part of the, the, the global OFN team supporting new instances to get started. And particularly in the last um, three or four months, we've seen a lot of new countries deploying. Uh, just last week, uh, OFN uh, Sri Lanka deployed. Uh, before that, OFN India, uh, Brazil has recently deployed. Lots of new countries coming on board, so I'm really excited that, that Ireland is, is going to be joining joining the, the global community. I'm going to share my screen and I'll start off with this map. Um, I just want to check that you can see this map now. Um, it 
it's as, as, as my colleagues were saying earlier, it's looking a little bit, a uh, little bit thin at the moment. Um, and what I'm hoping is that it will look a little bit like this quite soon. So this is this is the the map that I helped. Um, I'm helping to. I'm, I'm part of the team helping to grow this map. Um, you'll see the the tractor symbols here are the the producers who are, who are sitting there. They're waiting for somebody to sell their produce. Um, and you also see these shop symbols. And these shops are. Uh, hubs. They are they are organisations that are um, selling produce from multiple um, multiple farmers. Some of these farmers will have their own shop front. Um, this is what the shop front looks like. Uh, so this is one of our shop fronts in Wales. Uh, every shop front has its own its own logo, its own name, um, and uh, it it controls the shop front. It has a little little uh, page here where they can give messages to their to their shoppers, and um, it has contact details and so on. Uh, but the, the shop itself is where we um, is where the products are sold. Um, we have filters here, so if I'm interested in just the dairy products, I can see just dairy products. Um, we can also filter by certain properties. Uh, so if you only want to see organic products or plastic-free or vegan, um, so there's, there's different filters that we can see. And when we actually start to look at the products, um, we can see uh, some more detail about product. Probably most importantly in terms of our values you can actually find out a bit more about the producer. So against every product you have a, a, a clickable link that takes you to, to show you who produced this cheese, how they make it and then links to actually uh, contact that producer and find out more about, about their production methods. Uh, the other point about transparency is price transparency. So against every product there is a little pie chart and if you click on the pie chart you can see how much of the cost of that product is going to go direct to the producer and then any other fees that are added to the to the price of that product. Maybe administrative fees, so that the food hub that I'm part of, we, we have about 50 different producers selling through us and we have a team of people who receive that produce on a Saturday morning, they sort it into boxes and then it goes out either for home delivery or to pick up points. And obviously there is a cost involved in that. And so we, we make a markup using the OFN system. We make a markup to cover that, that charge. In some cases, producers will be collecting for each other. So if a, if a producer is driving past somebody else's farm on their way to the hub, they may pick up produce from one or two other neighboring farmers and they may add a distribution fee, um, which is a percentage charge on top of the, the selling price of the product. And all of these fees are, are visible to the, to the shopper so they can see exactly how much of that selling price is going to, to which stakeholders in, in, the, in the system. Um, and obviously on the shop front, you can then break it down. So this, this cheese manufacturer is breaking it down by, uh, by the types of cheese. Um, you can also break it down um, by weight, um, by flavors and so on. So that's the shop front. Uh, maybe we'll quickly, let's just put a little order in there and then we can go to the basket. Um, problem I have with the basket. Okay, so, so somebody else has already ordered that cheese in the, pro in the time that it took me to, to place that order. Let's try a different cheese. Let's have some of this one. And that one is not going to check out as well. So that. I'm going to go back here and try again. Um, so it's just reloading that shop page. Let's try meat instead. Let's see if I get any more luck with meat. Okay, so that, that meat product. Basically, many of our um, many of our producers are more scale. A lot of the people who sell through the open food network may be um, selling surplus produce from their garden. It may be that they're selling um, allotment surpluses. It may be that they're, they're producing jams or cakes or whatever in, the, in their own kitchen. And they're producing quite small volumes. And they may be selling through several shop fronts. They may have their own shop front to sell direct. And they may be also supplying several hubs. So it, it is, it is it's really important that we keep on top of stock levels. and we the producer sets a stock level for each product and that as that as the product is sold it counts down and then it will disappear from the shop front but the shopper once they have um once they've 
selected their produce, they will enter their, their details, their, their contact details, they'll select where they want to pick up from. And the shop, the shop front can set up multiple pickup points. This one has only one uh, collection point. Um, obviously home delivery is a big, has been much on the increase recently. So quite often people will offer home delivery. And if they're offering home delivery, they may charge for that. So rather than it being a free pickup point, uh, that there will be a charge and that charge will be added to the basket at check-in. Um, the shopper puts in any special instructions, they then have different payment options. It may be that um, you want to accept payment by bank transfer, you may want to accept cash on collection, cash on delivery, um, you may want to take uh, PayPal payments. You can set up multiple payment methods and the, the shopper can, can choose which one they want to, to select at checkout. When they click here, they would receive an email confirming the order and an email would go to the, to the shop front manager to, to tell them that that order has come through. So that's a very quick whistle stop tour through the front end. Uh, this is, I will show you the back end now. So this is not visible to the, to the everyday shopper. Uh, this is where we can manage the food hub. This is the food hub that I helped set up 18 years ago now in Strand and it's been using the Open Food Network for the last five years. And here I can, I can set up um, all my social media contacts. I can add images to my, to my shop front. I can set up different shipping methods. That, that was the, the, the pickup point for the home delivery. I can set up multiple shipping methods, multiple payment methods. I can add fees. So this is the, the markups that you were seeing. Those percentage charges can be added to the, um, to the price of the product at checkout. I can manage those here. Uh, I can set an inventory setting. So if some of my producers are selling through multiple hubs, then we have an inventory function that allows each hub to limit how much of a particular product they're going to sell. So it's like a virtual stock holding. Uh, I can set up different rules, tag rules. This allows me to customize the shop front to, for different shoppers. So it may be that some of my shoppers um, don't have credit cards or banks, uh, they don't have their own bank account, and they may want to pay cash. So what I might want to do is to allow a trusted shopper to, to say, I will pay cash on delivery. But I don't want to make that visible to everybody. Um, I want it only visible to certain shoppers. So I can tag the payment method. I can tag the cash on collection payment method and tag the shopper. And then only that shopper will be able to see that option when they log in with that tagged email address. Uh, there's lots of options here. We, we have uh, a, an option to set a notice about the shop front that appears at, um, before people make their order. That's been particularly useful during COVID when we were setting up the different you might get your video I can off. specify the order in which I will. Okay, am I, am I breaking up a bit? Your video sorry. Your breaking up there. Yeah, I'm sorry, let me do that. Okay, let's try it without the video. Is that is that clear now, David? Perfect. Okay. Um, so yes, an, an option to um, to change the category. So if I wanted the meat to appear uh, at the, if I wanted to put the special offers down here and the fish at the beginning, I can, I can move these around and just and change the order in which the product would appear on the shop front. Um, and I can set up subscriptions. Um, subscriptions allows me to uh, to set up a shopper to receive the same order every week. So this is really helpful for box schemes. If somebody wants a veg box ordered every week without having to log in and, and order it, we can set up a regular box. Or uh, with our food hub, we don't, we don't sell boxes, but somebody might say, I want a pint of milk and a piece of cheese and um, a bottle of apple juice every week. That will be a regular order. It will be automatically put into their basket they'll receive an email each week to tell them that, that it has been put in their basket and they'll be given a time window uh, within which they can change that. And if they don't make any changes, we'll take payment and um, that it will be delivered uh, automatically to the, to the shopper. Um, so that's the, the sort of admin dashboard. Um, I want to talk you through products briefly. Um, so, a producer um, would set up on the on the Open Food Network. It takes five or ten minutes to set up. They'd have a free listing on the on the Open Food Network. Uh, they would then set up their products. They might import them from an Excel spreadsheet. 
um, or they might just manually add the products. And they would they would put the name of the of the producer. They put the name of the product. Uh, they specify whether they want to sell it by weight or by volume or by item. If they want to sell a bunch of carrots, then we could specify a, a, a bunch rather than a, an individual uh, weight. Uh, they'd set it up with the category. They'd say what kind of product it, it is, um, and they would set a price. So that the price that the producer sets is the price that they will be paid for that product. The hub then has the option to add a markup, add an enterprise fee on top of that, which will be the final selling price to the shopper. They would set a stock level, and this is particularly important during COVID. We had a lot of panic buying people out very quickly, so we encourage people not to use the unlimited box, which will actually specify how much product they had available. If they're back registered, they would put that in here. If it was a chilled or frozen product, they would specify that. This really helps with, with the home deliveries to know which products need uh, to be chilled and frozen. And then they would add a, they would select a, an image to go up against that product. And then they would have some pretext here to, to put in a product description uh, with the option to add a link uh, if they wanted to link to an outside website to, to describe that product in more detail. So the producers would set up products like that. Um, they would then give permission to a hub to set. Well, they might just set up their own shop front. It is, as, as Yvonne said, many of the people using the Open Food Network will simply add their products, set, set it up with uh, shipping methods and payment methods and start to sell direct from the farm. But many hubs across the world actually are using this permissions function to give permission to other people to sell their products. So maybe the producer um, knows a neighboring farmer who has an open food network shop front and they, they want to give permission to that farmer to sell their products as, as well as um, the products from that farm. So a, a, a producer can um, give permission to another producer who has a shop front to sell their products for them or maybe pr uh, permission to a hub. So uh, I'm, I'm seeing lots of different producers here because I have, I have access to, to, to multiple producers, but let's say uh, Borough Wines. Uh, so the, this is the name of the, of the producer, of the farmer, the grower, the producer, and they can give permission to anybody who has a shop front. So this is the three or 400 shop fronts on, on Open Food Network UK at the moment. Um, so they might want to give permission to Farmer Food Co-op to add products to an order cycle. An order cycle is a period during which a shopper or a buyer can place an order for delivery or collection at a particular time. So this is the simplest level of permission that the, the borough wires gives permission to this food co-op to add products to an order cycle. It may be that this, this producer, uh, for, for, for various reasons, wants the hub to manage their products for them. A lot of the people that we work with, that I work with on a daily basis, are very good at growing food, but they're not very good at IT. <laughs> and they want somebody else to do the, to manage their products for them. They want to be able to phone up and say, can you add carrots to my product list? Or can you take broccoli off? Or can you change the stock level? So the, the producer can give permission to, to anybody else to, to manage their products, or even to edit their profile, to, to completely you know, have control of their, their profile on the Open Food Network. And I mentioned inventory earlier. So there is sometimes a need for a producer to ask a hub to limit the amount of product that they sell. And if the producer gives the hub permission to add products to inventory, the hub can then change lots of details about that product before it actually appears on the shop front. So if the producer has given permission to the hub to add to the order cycle, then we can go to this order cycles page I'm just checking my time. I want to make sure I don't overrun here. I think I've got about another five minutes. So as I, as I mentioned, an order cycle is a period during which the shopper or the buyer can place an order for delivery or collection at a particular time. I want to just show you um, my order cycle. So let me just filter that a little bit. Um, and this is the this is my shop front. Um, we have 700 products loaded there at the moment. Let me just open this up and show you how this works. So each order cycle has a name. 
um, a unique name, which is normally the, the, the date. Uh, and, and this one is week 32, which is our current week. Uh, an order cycle has an opening and a closing time. Normally we recommend that these are back to back so that as one order cycle closes, the next one opens. But particularly during COVID, we've, we've had to have shorter order cycles with a closed period to allow the producers time to, to confirm stock levels for the following week. Um, and then within the order cycle, you will see these are the different producers who are selling in through the Stroudco Food Hub. Um, there are uh, 50 uh, all uh, the same, uh, they don't all sell every week. Some of them are seasonal producers who might be selling you know, turkeys at Christmas or whatever. Um, and then uh, I can see the products that that producer is selling. Um, and here's where I'm adding my fee. And a hub can add a different fee for different producers. So if I scroll down here, uh, you'll see that that top producer was, was we were making a 25% markup on his products. And that might be because we have to manage his products for him. It might be because we have to collect from the farm. There's all sorts of reasons why it may be more expensive for us to, to manage that producer. Um, so the markup happens here. Uh, this is a little message that goes to the uh, to the producer when we when we send the purchase order in, um, and this is a unique message that goes to this particular producer. During um, during COVID times, of course, we've had to socially distance the producers delivering to the hub, so we can give them time slots so they deliver. Um, they don't all arrive at the same time. We give them time slots. And we're also giving the shoppers time slots. If the shoppers are picking up from a pickup point, then they, they're given a specific time slot to pick up. So these are the products that are coming into my order cycle. And then uh, what we're seeing on the final part of the order cycle here is, is the, the actual distribution. So this is, this is all of those 700 products coming together. Um, we will be delivering those products uh, uh, on Friday the 7th of August. And here's a little message that will go out in the order confirmation to the shopper uh, to tell to, to, as a little reminder um, with, with their order confirmation. There is the option to have multiple distributors. So it may be that as well as all those products coming in to my hub as incoming products and being delivered by home delivery on, on Friday of this week, I might want to add another distributor. So it might be that I have a, a, a wholesale distributor delivering on a different day to, uh, uh, to in, in different places. So you can have multiple distributors on an order cycle. And we have this concept of what we call daughter hubs with the main hub and then different daughter hubs serving outlying villages or whatever, um, maybe on different days, uh, maybe with a, a school hall as a pickup point. Fast running out of time here, um, but I wanted to quickly show you orders. So um, remember, we're looking at the admin screen here and uh, the administrator of, of any hub can review the orders as they come in. They will receive an automatic email every time an order comes in, uh, but they might want to, to come here and actually um, look at the, the orders that are coming in. They might want to filter it by the name of the shopper or the date range. Um, and, and then they, they can come down here and they can actually see these orders. One thing we have been doing recently is, is taking um, orders for people who don't have internet access. So there, there is the option to actually take a new order and actually take an order over a phone for people who don't have internet access. Particularly, you know, recently people have been socially distancing, um, more vulnerable people, maybe at home, maybe they don't have internet access, but they do want to, want to make an online order. So there is the option to, to take orders over the phone. Um, and there's options to print invoices. So I may select, I might be wanting to select a range of different orders and then print the invoices so that we have uh, invoices going into the boxes uh, when they're delivered. Uh, I want to talk briefly about order uh, reports. So if you can imagine uh, the food hub that I'm helping to manage, 50 different producers, 800 different products, maybe 50, 60 different orders coming in. We do need a fairly sophisticated system to actually manage the sorting of the boxes. So there's lots of different reports here that, that sort that data by customer and by supplier so that we have pick lists and checklists to make sure the right product is in the right box for the right customer. 
Um, we can export to mailing lists to do mailings to, through using things like MailChimp or exporting to accounting systems. Um, lots of different reports here. Uh, Open Food Network's been built by people like you, people who run food enterprises and want to <laughs> minimize the admin and maximize the amount of time producing good food. So what we've, what we've tried to do is to, to produce as many different features and functions to, to, to make it easier for you to, to, to get food to, to shoppers. Um, so the, this, this, the software is constantly evolving. Uh, you're, you're about to hear from one of my colleagues, Powell, who is, uh, as well as uh, helping manage Katuma in, in, uh, under, in, in uh, Barcelona, he also is part of the, the product design team. And that team produces updates to the software every Tuesday. So the software is constantly evolving, constantly improving. And it's improving because people like you say, wouldn't it be nice if we could do this? And we, we, we're constantly improving the software. I think I might be nearly out of time. I just need just check what else I might need to do here. Uh, there is a groups function. Uh, so if you wanted to group together, um, this is a group that I help to manage, uh, which is open shop fronts, because there's quite a lot of shop fronts open and closed. Uh, so if people want to quickly get to a list of open shop fronts, then they can do that. But this function is quite often used geographically, so that there are certain geographical areas in the UK that want their own map. And you, you can set up a group to show just the producers and the shoppers in the particular area. Um, so that's sometimes useful. Okay. There's a load that I haven't covered. An end there. Yeah, I've talked very. I, I've talked too much, and I'm really happy to take questions. And I'm going to hand back to, to David at this point. Thank you. So you've talked uh, the exact amount of time that we requested. You gave us such a comprehensive overview. Uh, so um, listen to that silent applause there. Uh, so we have. Uh, a little time to to look at questions and um, if you want to ask a question put a h in the chat ask questions in the chat because they're being answered as we go through and uh, if you've just arrived we are recording this um, and we hope to share it so that more people can see it so i may just start the questions off nick and um, what we see with the ofn and these sort of digital platforms and digital marketplaces is the ability for access to local food but we could go wider, surely, with craft and other essential items and enable a local economy, not just a local food economy, with regions being uh, better ways to engage. So is there any examples of this, Nick? Yep, many, many different um, examples. One of the principles of OFN, we have, we have nine core values, which you can find on our, on our global um, website, openfoodnetwork.org. One of our core values is subsidiarity, that decisions should be made at the most local level possible. So if, as, as a food hub, you decide that you want to, to allow crafts to be sold or garden equipment to be sold, um, there, is, there is a team in each country that will, that will uh, keep an eye on the, on the platform. And if you start to sell second-hand cars or genetically modified battery farm chickens, then they will start to raise an eyebrow and they will be in touch with you. Uh, but assuming that you're doing something that, that, that the national team feel is appropriate, there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't sell whatever you like through the Open Food Network. Brilliant. Here's a question from Rita. What sort of turnover is Nick seeing in the UK? And is that making running the system viable? At what point is it economically sustainable? And I'm guessing the question is about my particular food hub um, rather than the national total. Um, my particular food hub is is turning over. We, we probably have about thirty orders a week, and the average order volume, uh, average order size is fifty fifty pounds sterling. Um, that allows us to pay about ten pounds an hour to the administrator of the hub. Um, I'm not personally involved in the day to day running, but uh, the, the the manager gets about ten pounds an hour, and then we pay our drivers um, um, the same rate to to actually deliver the produce. And yes, it is, it is making a very small profit at, at, that, at those volumes. It does need to build to about those volumes to make it viable. Uh, if it's below those volumes, then it does need a, a fair amount of volunteer, volunteer input to, to get it viable. Yeah. Of course, that's just one model within the Open Food Network. So if, if you're a producer selling direct, then you can, just, you, you, can, you can set your prices and make sure that those prices are, are viable to you. Well, here's a question from Gordon Reed. Uh, is it possible for an individual grower to join OFN or do you have to uh, join through a hub? 
No, that's absolutely possible for, I'm sorry, I, I didn't make that clear, that anybody can join the Open Food Network, however small or large their, their growing or farming enterprise is, anybody can join the Open Food Network. And that, that is the bedrock of the Open Food Network is, is hundreds of thousands, millions, if you like, even globally of growers who, who set themselves up on the Open Food Network. And then maybe they, they also set up a shop front or maybe they wait for a hub or a producer shop front to find them and sell their produce. But yes, you are completely welcome and very much encouraged to set up as a grower. Okay, I encourage some people to ask some questions, but here's another one from Evan in the chat. Uh, if you want to ask a question, put an H in the chat and I'll bring you in. On mass registration, can GIS forms be used to map up and register producers during one big push, given the registry burden for the hub admin making otherwise multiple communications to draw producers together? Okay, uh, complicated question and a complicated answer. Um, because of data protection, each individual producer needs to give us permission to, to set themselves up on the hub, on, on, the, on the network. So we do have a, um, a registration system that the email addresses need to be confirmed. Um, if the producers give permission to somebody else to set them up on their behalf, then of course it is possible for somebody to, to register an enterprise on behalf of somebody else, and then ownership of that enterprise can then be transferred later. Um, we do have automatic product imports, so we can import products from Excel spreadsheets, but we can't, at the current moment, we can't actually set up multiple enterprises from a spreadsheet, so there would be a manual process there. Um, and during COVID, we did have a, a, a wonderful team of volunteers who were, we, we had a massive increase in the number of people using the system during COVID. And they were, um, they were we were setting up an, an online system for producers to give us permission to, to set them up on their behalf and later transfer ownership. But at the moment, that is a manual process. Great. Um, again, insights could be shared both in the chat or come in with an H in the chat or put your hand up. Here's a question for Galam. Galam. There's an OFN UK and an OFN Ireland. Uh, are the platforms hosted separately and can we have products sold across the border with Northern Ireland? It's maybe too early to say, but any thoughts on that, Nick? Yeah, um, we are aiming ultimately, well, in the, in the very long term for a single global instance of OFN because we, we, we think country boundaries are, are irrelevant and unnecessary. Um, in the short, in the sort of shorter term, we're probably looking at a European instance, uh, but currently, mainly because of currencies, currencies are the big stumbling block for us. Uh, we, but we, what we do need at the moment is a single national instance, particularly in mainland Europe. This is an issue, and um, we've just had a bit of a breakthrough with um, producers in OFN Italy being able to sell on OFN France. Now, I don't fully understand technically how that has been possible. But surely. Surely um, we're really trying to enable local, regional production and consumption. So it's only really for instances that would be along a border or their, yeah. their catchment area would be on a border. Otherwise, we don't want, we want to reduce supply chains, not um, enable long supply chains. Well, possibly. I mean, what we, what we, what we do have in the, in the UK is um, one of our producers is something called the Sail Cargo Alliance that's using sailing ships to bring olive oil and uh, citrus fruit from, from Portugal and Spain across the Bay of Biscay to the UK and then selling through UK hubs. And the reason we are allowing that is partly because we love their, 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 their enterprise model, but partly because shoppers are going to buy olive oil and they're going to buy citrus fruit, you know, and if they can't buy it from a local hub, they're going to go to a supermarket. So again, this was a decision we made in the UK. If you as a group decide you only want to sell local, then of course, that's your decision. Obviously, solidarity economies uh, is the exception. You know, when we're in solidarity with other places, supporting communities in other places by connecting our local communities to them. Anyone brave enough to unmic their mic and let's hear some other voices? It can be an observation, maybe a way that we could accelerate OFN in Ireland. We're just getting going. Uh, we want to be a solidarity co-op, so that's multi-stakeholder, so entities, businesses, producers, consumers, agencies could all be members of this co-op. Any reflections or questions? Sean O'Farrell, are you on mute in your mute mic? mic? Yeah, yes, thank you, David. I'm just wondering, are there any ways to avoid um, bluts of certain products, uh, products, you know, and, and uh, fill the gaps where there are needs? Ready, Sean. Nick, any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I mean, that's what OFN is set up to do that. It's set up so that a producer, a producer may have you know, several routes to market already, um, but it may be that they have a sudden glut and they, they want to get that you know, distributed. So if they're part of the open food network, they could have their own shop front uh, selling bits and pieces, but they could, if they had a glut, give permission to all of the neighboring hubs and neighboring producers with shop fronts to sell, to sell their product. And that could then be a way to, to quickly distribute that product uh, more widely. Um, but particularly during COVID, this, this is what producers were learning, that they, didn't, they, they shouldn't rely on a single route to market. And it was important to have as many connections as possible so that they could, if, if one particular, you know, particularly the hospitality trade dried up very quickly in COVID and all the, half, the, the cafes and restaurants were closed and people needed to shift product very quickly. And because OFN enables these relationships, the, these permissions, uh, to be as, as, as multiple as possible, then that, that is a way of quickly shifting routes. Okay, we've still got a few minutes for more questions. So Arul in the chat. Strange question, Arul. Uh, can I allow only select audience, i.e. refuse uh, certain customers? Now, I thought you'd maybe refuse certain producers because they're not producing organically or ethically or locally. But the question is, can we exclude certain customers yes you can there is an option within OFN to uh, it was a screen I flicked over very quickly where you can actually set up your shop front to be private so it's only visible to registered customers so customers would have to register with you first and once they were registered they would then be able to see the shop front you can also use the tagging system that I mentioned briefly to make the order cycle uh, the, 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 the shop visible only to certain customers so you can you can tag the order cycle to be not visible by default and then tag it so that certain customers can see it and what about the exclusion of certain producers that might not be ethical do you just allow people to sell coca-cola on it or is there <laughs> so the, the producer can give permission to the hub to sell their products and that was the, the screen i showed you the hub then can choose whether or not to add them to the order cycle. So there's the, the two stage process there. The producer needs to give permission to the hub. The hub then needs to choose whether or not to add them to the order cycle and then can be selective about certain products. So it may be that you want to sell some of the products from that producer, but not all of them. So you can then deselect certain products to make them not visible on the shop front. I think Karen has a question. Great, Karen. Um, I'd love to hear your insights and questions. Hi, everybody. This is this is fantastic. Thanks a million for organising. It's really good to listen to um, what's happening around the country and around the world. Um, a couple of questions, really, and I suppose just to put in context is, um, I'm here with Yvonne and Deirdre, and I saw Ruth and Evan, and there may also be a few other people from the Cottage Market Network, um, which has been running for a few years now. Um, it didn't technically come out of GIY, it was hosted by GIY. Um, it's actually come out of a whole group of people uh, who have either been running markets themselves in their local communities, supported by a whole number of producers, um, not just food actually, food and art and crafts, um, which we have found really beneficial in terms of providing diversity within the markets, um, but also making sure that, you know, they're more appealing to kind of different customers who may not come, maybe not have, you know, local food high on their value, on their, as a value, but really want really amazing jewellery or, or something else, but you, you get them in whichever, which way. Um, so the cottage market itself, just as a kind of heads up, is, is in a little bit in limbo at the moment. It's setting up independently, um, out, well out of GIY, um, but there's still 25 of them, give or take, in operation around the country. And doing and something like this is going to be hugely beneficial um, to us all. Um, I suppose a question that I would have given that intro is one of the stumbling blocks that we came across. Well, two, actually, two of the ones that I can think of, Yvonne and, and Deirdre may, may add to this or not. Um, first of all, there was always challenges around insurance and you know all the documentation that goes with and the responsibilities that go with selling food um and i just wonder how that's a, how that's addressed here and whose responsibility is it to do this because let's face it none of us like chasing down paperwork and yet at the end of the day it's it's all part of being a responsible um, customer. Um, let's hold it there because we're running out of time but that would be oh, okay. really um it's the thing is crippling local economies is insurance right now yeah 
all across the board. And the second question is, you know, I agree completely that we need to do our best to compete in a propor proportionate way with the big boys and girls in the retail world who have huge marketing and advertising budgets to spend. But at the same time, we found a huge challenge with the cottage market was getting people who don't have the time or maybe the interest or the skill to take yeah. good photos, good marketing, tell good stories, good narration, good storytelling, which is critical. So uh, yeah, just really keen to find out more about it. Definitely necessity is the mother of invention. I don't think we'll be convincing anyone of the need to join this. These sort of platforms will be critical if we're gonna flourish and be able to build a resilience to cope with where we're in or what's coming down the line. But let's just, so we need to be, yes, communicating, and, and you guys are always brilliant at that, communicating, and maybe there's opportunities for the country market and maybe GIY to help put a bit of focus on someone like OFN. But maybe quickly, and we're out of time, but just insurance, Nick, uh, just anything uh, OFN can help with. Yeah, so I'm a great believer in minimizing uh, bureaucracy as much as possible. I dislike the insurance industry intensely myself. Um, Obviously, insurance is necessary, and particularly if, if somebody is producing meat, then we do need to make sure that the proper insurance is in place. Um, what we found in the UK is that when we set up a food hub, we need to contact the local um, uh, council. They then set it up as a food enterprise. They would ask us a few questions about how we were handling that food. Uh, in, the, in the case where we take possession of that food, then we do need to have insurance cover. But it is possible to set up OFN so that ownership of the product does not pass to the hub. It goes directly from the producer to the to the end, end user. Obviously, the, the, the producer will need their own insurance, um, and that is that is the responsibility of the producer. Um, well, obviously, um, it depends. If, if you're just producing uh, vegetables or, or uh, small quantities of, of produce from your own home, then uh, you don't. You know, I would encourage you not to go to the expense of insurance. But if you're a larger scale producer, particularly producing meat, then there, there is a need for, for some form of insurance. Um, but ideally, the hub can avoid, uh, can, can minimise the amount of insurance. And that's, again, the principle of sub subsidiarity. It's very much down to each individual group to make their own decision about how much insurance to take out. Um, okay, and there's I, some good uh, insights in the chat about different insurance companies that give good deals. It's a big conversation. I think it's someone we need a strategy for in many of the community-led cooperative local uh, sectors. So let's uh, move on. There's still space to, to bring a question or especially an insight into the chat, and we'll be harvesting that and sharing it back. Uh, we have now three short voices from across Europe, voices from the OFN field. So we're going to hear uh, just a, a few minutes, really, from each, uh, from Rachel from OFN France and from Pau from OFN Katuma and Fran from OFN Italy. So, Rachel, you're one of the steering group of OFN France. Uh, what was your experience? How have you found that? Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invite. I'm really happy to be here. So, yes, uh, OFN France started around the end of the year 2017. Um, we, when the project started, we weren't sure there was space in France for a new platform. There was already much, we have a vibrant C CSA network. There is a food assembly, which is very big in France, of course, and, and, and lots of different projects. So we were wondering, is there space for something like the, the Open Food Network? And um, we finished, uh, I think 2019 was a turnover of around 1.5 million of euros. Uh, this without doing any marketing or communication because we're, we were just a team of volunteers. Um, and so it really showed that there was uh, a space for that, um, especially so um, producers. So we have single producers, we have cooperatives, we have um, buying groups, citizens um, um, using the platform to, to do something in their neighborhood. We really have various models. Uh, but the stories from these people are always the same. They come to us because um, um, one important thing they are telling us is that we are we cannot be bought. So this is something very important to them. They don't want to um, participate to an, a new startup thing that will be bought tomorrow and maybe the, the platform doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so this is very important. So this is also why we are we are now uh, creating sense to this um, 
good experiment that we have a, a platform co-op as well. So uh, from your introduction of the legal structure um, in Ireland, I think we are quite building the same a solidarity co-op where everyone can uh, hold shares. So this will really reinforce the what we build is cannot be bought <laughs> part. And, um, and they were also coming because um, you know, the world project is, is building on opos open source licenses, not only for, for, the, for, for the software, but also all the knowledge, like legal knowledge around what, how, how can I build my, my short food chain system? Uh, what is available? What should I do? Um, all this knowledge is, is deeply documented and, uh, and very interesting also to see what other countries are doing within the OFN and maybe there are some models that you can, can build. And um, yeah, one other thing that we, they, they really like about this, and I, I will finish with this, is that um, there are other platforms in France that are open source, but usually they are led by one or two developers. It's, it's a bit the, the story of someone who had a nice idea over a weekend and started to develop something, which works. But in two years from now, maybe this, this person will be bored and stop working on that. And this happens for a lot of projects. And suddenly they had a platform, but nobody to maintain it. Whereas on the Open Food Network, we, are, we have a, a, a really good team um, of several developers. And we have a, around 100 developers already contributed to the code base. Uh, and this really ensures also resilience in, OK, it's open source, but there is a community behind it, it's not just for the fun of publishing code <laughs> on, the, on the web. Um, and yeah, d during COVID, everything exploded. Um, the traffic went 10 times higher. The turnover of each project as well. We have producer who um, ha had a turnover um, that was multiplied by six, which went really crazy, but the platform was still there to sustain and, and work. And um, so yeah, this, we, we it was crazy, <laughs> but we, we are, uh, get, getting out of this with uh, a, a, a more stronger community uh, yeah. and, and face into, into the OFN. Brilliant, Rachel. Loads of silent applause there uh, for Rachel. What a great story. Uh, we're just going to continue and again put any questions. We're going to have a 10 minutes after this. Any questions or insights as we hear these three speakers? So Pau is from OFN Katuma, which is on the border between Spain and Portugal. And as we've heard, is involved in uh, OFN Global. Uh, so, Pau, again, tell us your OFN story. Yeah, so hello, everyone. So our story is quite similar to what Rochelle explained about France, is that we are a little younger than France, uh, but our project goes beyond that. We started in the 2013, um, a bunch of developers trying to prototype an application that was doing exactly the same as OFN. So we were a bunch of people from the agroecological sector in the Barcelona area. So we were all members of our own hubs. So basically in the city in Barcelona, you can find a hub in every neighborhood. So we were belonging to different hubs and we thought we needed a better tool to, to make it easier for hubs to, to become stronger. But we were seeing that there were lots of costs to run software, to host the software, to maintain it, blah, 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 you know, customer support. So we thought, why don't we build something that, that is a service we offer to others? So hubs don't need to host a, a software to run. So that was our idea, but then it was in 2017 when we, because this project was developed as a side project and just for fun and love. And so in 2017, we, we started working on that like more professionally, uh, like sort of part-time. And then we realized there was another project already in production was, that was OFN. And so at some point we decided to ditch our prototype because it was midway still being developed. And what we gained was uh, international community of people doing the same things for the same values and with lots of know-how that we could use locally and that's why we jumped in into the team and we joined as developers 
but also meanwhile we were developing the local community in the Barcelona area. But then things evolved and at some point there were people in Portugal trying to do the same, uh, trying to bootstrap their instance and we offered ours um, just because it didn't make any sense for them to run the costs, running the servers and so on. So they just joined and that's why it's a joint instance, the first one, I think. And we're still there. Portugal still is trying to, to set up and grow. But the nice thing about the co-op uh, model is that everyone in the General Assembly in Kaduma decided that it was for free for them to, to set up just because it wasn't that expensive for us to contain a couple or four hubs in Portugal and we wanted them to, to, to be on board. And that was a much greater value than a few euros to maintain their hubs. Um, so that's, that's our story. Yeah. Thanks, Pau. Um, silent applause there, or even you can unmute and have real applause. Uh, but let's keep moving. Uh, we're moving from Spain, Portugal, across to Italy. Uh, and Fran, Francesca from OFN Italy, uh, you are going to share some insights from that part of the world. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so I'm Fran, I'm part of OFN Italy, uh, but I'm also working for the OFN um, in the UK, I'm doing, I'm doing communications for them. Um, and I'm doing this part time, my day job is being a researcher at university. Um, also in food stuff. Um, so OFN Italy, it's at a very different stage than the previous, um, than France and, and, and Spain. Basically, we are now in the process of building it and we haven't launched it yet. So that's why it's very interesting to see um, OFN Ireland launching. Um, we are now about 10 people. Uh, we are in, in the steering committee and what we're doing right now is being in a setup stage is like three main things. So the first thing is that we're now a bit stuck into the bureaucracy. Uh, so we had, uh, Italian bureaucracy is not famous for being nice and easy. Uh, so we are now uh, in the process of creating a temporary committee, which is the, the form that we are uh, choosing um, our organization to be, to be called. Um, and so we are in the stage of trying to understand how, how this can work and who we have to ask and this, the permissions and everything and who has to be in charge of what. And so choosing the different um, the different roles and different responsibility inside um, inside the team. Um, and so this is the first thing that's the main thing at the moment and it's been going for, for a while now. Um, the second main thing that we are doing is uh, finalizing a sort of charter. So a sort of like um, theoretical foundation, like building blocks of the Italian instance. So there is a principle of subsidiarity, as we said before, uh, but we wanted to like put together a list of guidelines or some sort of um, yeah guidelines that uh, will help us uh, to to select and choose the producers that are into the OFN um, in Italy and um, so have only small producers and local producers. We don't know yet. We're we're trying to figure out uh, like what's the best uh, thing to do in in this in this direction. Um, the third thing is obviously the platform. I don't know much about this area, but um, I know that it's kind of ready and um, and all our developers uh, have worked on it thanks to the, to the global team as well. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know the jargon around it, but it should be ready. And I know it's been uh, tested also by several producers who have been very helpful in actually trying to put their products on it and, tr and trying to figure out if it works, if it's fine, etc. Um, so these are the three things and um, we are people, we're around 10 people right now and we are from very different backgrounds. Um, so we have developers, of course, um, and then people involved in the food system in different capacities um, for their day job as well. Uh, and also um, some of us are involved in the producers organizations and so in different regions of Italy from the north to the south. So that's very helpful because we have definitely a number of producers or already willing um, to, to join us and um, so that's super helpful and um, so we had definitely a, a good response even if we haven't started or launched yet we think that we will be able to gather a good number of producers uh, into the into the platforms so we've been approached by a number of producers already uh, thanks for to this connection that I've mentioned before um, and also other 
agri-food organizations so like mm, organizations that are putting together different pro producers and so we're figuring out in which capacity they could be involved so we don't really know if involving other other organizations or not and 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 in which capacity like which role and and like how to how to select them how to make them cooperate and like how to divide the responsibility and everything so that's also another thing that we're trying to figure out and also we've been approached by slow food um they have pro um, a project with fishermen uh, and they wanted to put together all the fishermen in the mediterranean area and trying to sell through the OFM. so Pepuma is involved as well in this so that's really nice as well. Um, so yeah, we hope to basically put together uh, the, the, the small producers that are a very important part of, of agriculture in Italy, um, but they often have an issue of reaching the markets. But, uh, and the I wanted to finish with one challenge that we, it's similar to what uh, has been said about France. Um, so having already a lot of initiatives that are similar to the OFN, in Italy, so the food assembly, for example, and all this kind of stuff. So there's already a lot going on, and we're trying to figure out how to put ourselves there. Fantastic, Fran. Uh, really, really interesting, all three of you. I think for me, right away, it highlights the need for interoperability. And I've been watching the French platforms really looking at how we can share data and have protocols so you can have multiple platforms. Uh, you know, so there's something really interesting there. And Fran, I think your story is very similar. In fact, all your stories are very similar about a group of people, a small group of people trying to push uh, this thing out. So very familiar, very familiar diversity and makeup of the groups as well. But hopefully this, uh, we can mainstream these uh, ideas. So we're going to go into discussion, but I'm going to invite uh, a participant here, Peter from Belfast, who um, after we put the schedule together, said, oh, we're, we're doing OFN in Belfast. I've got a little bit of a story. So let's start the conversation uh, around uh, um, how we progress this OFN or uh, any more questions needed to how we might get started. But Peter, what's your experience up there in Belfast with OFN Northern Ireland? Thanks, David. Um, well, myself and uh, Guillaume, who is also here uh, in the chat today, Guillaume was instrumental in setting up the OFN shop front for the food co-op um, and we really just registered officially as a co-op during lockdown so the opportunity that we have had as a co-op is really to make sure that we've got a shop front to sell our wholesale goods um, so the wholesale goods that we've ordered in have really resulted in two um, order cycles as Nick was saying before so we're effectively a monthly pop-up that's what we've really done very slowly growing into that we've had a lot of support from people like sam uh loveworks um in belfast there's a lot happening here in north belfast so we've been very fortunate without having a permanent venue we've done a pop-up um in the loveworks bakery so the order cycle we open up the shop effectively online through our social media channels uh, on a sunday night uh closing it on the friday night so that people were ordering on a Sunday right through to the Friday, and we would be manically boxing everything up based on the orders taken on a Saturday morning. Uh, so a collection was also set. We weren't delivering, we were allowing people to come in socially distance, of course, during these surreal times to come in on a Saturday morning and just collect in between 10 and one. What the system also enabled us to do, because we did this in June and we did this last weekend, is it allowed us to also you know, we could advertise on a Saturday morning and say what stock we had left over. Yeah. Uh, stock is very precious, so we we're able to sort of also say to people, you can actually come and buy excess stock. Uh, we found it really useful. Um, I think some of the stuff that uh, Nick was talking about this evening, um, about getting other producers involved, like Loveworks Bakery, like yeah. local producers, being able to network with them is really exciting. And I think that's how we hope to grow uh, from here on in. Brilliant, Peter, and uh, really starting to help us see how we can connect with other entities. Uh, we have a question here for Joe Sheridan. Can artisan drinks uh, products with alcohol be sold in the platform? And then Evan in the chat uh, almost answered him. Yes, Joe, begins with an A. So it's the first on the list in the product category demo. So uh, anyone from any of the iterations, I mean, definitely in our local market, there's a local brewery. It's a no brainer to have uh, a local brew uh, supporting the local economy. Anyone from the from Europe or Nick? Any any thoughts on that? 
yeah, why not? Sell whatever you like. Obviously, you need a license if you're going to be selling um, alcohol. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you need to get so only them it needs a license, not the shop front or the hub, right? Well, it depends. If, if the hub is going to take ownership of the product, then the hub will be the license. But of course, it depends on how you, how you manage. If, if the product goes direct from the producer to the, to the shopper, then only the producer needs yeah, that. That's the way. I know Rob Hopkins has got that brewery in Totnes, the new Lion, and they have deliveries now. Uh, so I wonder if there's a way that you can still use the platform to enable it, but the delivery comes straight. Yep, absolutely, of course. Any thoughts, reflections, questions into the chat? If you want to come in, H in the chat, or put your hand up, I can only see a fraction of you. Any questions on how you might use it or any suggestions of how we might accelerate? There's a lot of questions, Davey, in the, in the thread about uh, services and offering services through the hub. Okay. If that's possible. So, I mean, obviously we've talked about craft there, but other services through the hub. Any, uh, Rachel or any of the other Europeans? For, for uh, I think Rachel has answered this, uh, the, 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 this question like on the, on, on, on the chat, but maybe you should uh, go ahead and say it again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay, v very quickly. We have uh, indeed now s starting to see services popping up like, um, there is a hub that is selling tickets for the local theater. Um, and uh, we also now have a, a massage uh, specialist giving her uh, booking massage um, on, on the OFN. I would say the UX is not perfect for that because when you're offering a services, you need a lot of space to explain what the service is. What do you mean by UX? Uh, sorry, the, the user experience on the platform. Any other thoughts on this? Uh, widening sorry, beyond my, my network is big. You're fine, Rachel. We caught you there. That was great. Peter? Yeah, I think just a question. Obviously, we're in uh, Northern Ireland and Belfast, and you know this is sort of an island-wide uh, network. So it does beg the question about sort of transactions between you know, pound sterling and, and euro. And I'm just wondering, uh, you may have touched upon a little bit earlier, but this is potentially going to be a key question for the growth of the, the network being used here uh, in the north. I'm just wondering if you have any kind of commentary on that. Um, well, I still without, think it's it, maybe without using the B word, you know. I think it's still enabling local markets. There's only border regions I think that will affect or the way that we were doing solidarity with products. Um, but maybe we need to, maybe it's something that in the longer term, a, a, a platform like this could enable a local currency or a trading currency between OFN networks or some way to enable, you know, these local currencies that we see emerging or the old let system, local exchange trading systems, you know, we're going to need those again, you know, maybe not being dependent on the euro or the pound could be useful. Any thoughts on that, anyone? I'd quite like to ask Rochelle to talk a little bit about the, her experience of linking um, Italian producers into OFN France or the other way around. I can't remember which way it was. But just before she does that, um, uh, a guy called Bevan, who is um, managing the instance in Open Food Network South Africa, has got this fantastic idea of, of uh, an open food coin, an open food currency, where people trade um, using using a, a virtual currency which is then not it, t it cuts out the banking system basically um, and I, I, you need to talk to him to get more detail on that but I, I do wonder if we might actually be able to use the open food network to actually blow apart you know lots of the the world problems around the banking system and borders and currencies and so on and I would I would love to find a way to 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 for for trading across yeah. that kind of you thought you would come to a webinar on virtual marketplaces, not uh, revolution and transformation. Yeah, brilliant. This is exactly what we need, though, um, to think locally and regionally, especially regionally, keeping our wealth circulating in our regions, providing meaningful jobs and livelihoods, and a mechanism like Open Food Network where producers and makers can get access to market and people become, be, can become prosumers. So our livelihood streams are both producing and uh, we can consume in the local economy. So we're, we're coming to the close. So we're looking at now, what are your final questions? How do we uh, think about what our next steps are? 
um, and we're going to just hear from Floss on uh, how to get involved in OFN Ireland. And as you realise, we're at a very early stage. <coughs> so Floss, can you give us a bit of uh, insight into where people go next? Thanks, Davey. Um, yeah, uh, basically we're going to do our best to make the next steps as smooth and user-friendly as possible. Um, so first of all, in terms of feedback from tonight, um, we want to make sure we've got clarity on all the issues that were raised and that information is accessible for future reference. So as has been mentioned, um, the call has been recorded and the recording will be shared on the website. We'll be collating all the questions and the comments on this evening and a feedback email will be sent out in the next few days. So any questions that we didn't get to tonight, um, we'll address them in the email. Um, There'll also be an unsubscribe link in that just for GDPR purposes. So as it stands, we've got a list of all the email addresses of everyone who's registered for the webinar. If you don't want to receive any future emails, please just use the unsubscribe link and you'll take you off that list. So that's just a bit of, about the feedback from tonight. Um, and then in terms of the next step for using the platform, um, we've been given the green light from tech for people to go ahead and set up their, their, their accounts. Um, the Stripe for the platform is live and can process payments. It's just to remember that individual shop fronts will need their own Stripe or similar account to accept their online payments. So the facility is active on our website, but you'll need your own Stripe account. Um, and just to say that there will probably be a few teething issues that will only show their face um, as users start to set up profiles. So if there are any problems um, or snags as you're getting set up, please get in touch with us either via the email or on the community forum. Um, when users sign up, uh, you'll see a community forum link in the main menu. You don't need to sign up to it separately. And it's pretty straightforward. You can go in there and just start a thread with whatever your issue is, and one of us will get on, get on to helping you solve it. Um, so that's basically just in terms of that. We're ready to go. Um, and any issues, just get in touch with us. There Thanks, Ross. Um, Thanks, Davey. Okay, so we've got a few minutes if, if there's any burning questions. I mean, if we can really capture them in the chat, it really is helpful, but it's quite good to hear some other voices. But really now, how do we get going? How do we join Yvonne in that lonely map of Ireland? Uh, what can we do to get more uh, communication on this? How do we communicate this through our own networks? So this is an option. Any thoughts on that? Uh, Evan is asking, are there examples of how civic society support has uh, manifested within other OFN is instances? Maybe uh, Rachel or how, or is there any examples of civil society, maybe organizations engaging with the platform or with the supporting the, the instance? Mm, I can tell you about something different universities so there is a local um so there is a research group in the open university of catalonia who have um it's a research group about the internet and the future of platform codes and so and they've been uh, great great uh, partners of us uh, because they support us and they well they fund resources sometimes but they bring into the table lots of different ideas and it's great for them to see their ideas in practice and for us to see how those minds can bring in knowledge into our practice. Great. Any other questions, Karen, again? Uh, sorry, less of a question and Davy more responding to your question just asked. I mean, I think it's brilliant that there's such energy and enthusiasm and commitment to making this happen. And then of course, it's all about what are the next steps? So, you know, Ireland is a much, much smaller country than any of the others that we've listened and heard from today. And I think we have to be really careful that we're realistically ambitious, but that we do enough to pilot, test, go through those teething problems, et cetera, et cetera, because we don't have as much online football. Um, there's a lot of competition out there with other platforms doing similar, albeit with perhaps some different principles. And at the same time, there's pockets of producers, um, some of which are in a glut. I think somebody uh, identified that earlier. And then others that may have loads of one thing, but really missing the others. And at the same time, 
we're all consumers ourselves. We like to be able to get, you know, our standard shopping done and it to be consistent and for there to be quality and then allow for lovely bits and pieces to come in. So my question to you is this, is there a kind of a strategy in place or one to be developed to say, okay, you know, what's our plan for the rest of 2020? Is it to have six? Is it to have two north, south, you know, whatever, um, that they're spread geographically? Um, is it to say, is it to identify people like Yvonne and Deirdre who are used to the setting up and the running of a, a, an, on, an offline, excuse me, physical market perhaps yeah. to take that experience to bring it online? You know, so you almost kind of do yeah. a targeted recruitment. Well, just quickly on that, because you raised some interesting points. We, yes, we are as the steering group, which people are welcome to join. We have a Slack channel and we've all contributed 50 euros through Open Collective, which in our report, we're going to send you the link if anyone feels like just supporting this very short term. And we're trying to work with ICOS to develop uh, both the, the Solidarity Co-op, which would allow us to bring more people in uh, that could do a lot of the things that um, you, you highlight there, Karen. So it's, it's building the capacity of both the platform and of the community that are going to own and hold that platform, um, as well as making it more palatable and easy for producers. And I loved how Nick showed that even consumers that weren't digital savvy could phone up for an order and still get their, their order. So I, I think there's a lot to explore here. But I think the big opportunity is the moment we're in. We were having this webinar four months ago. You couldn't expect us even 60 of us to be sitting in a room together like this, never mind using technology in, to enable conversations and trade locally. So we're see, it's a, things are happening fast, things need to happen faster. And something like Open Food Network has so many added benefits, building social capital, reducing our vulnerability to long supply chains, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. There's so many other ways that we could get actual support or traction because it's doing a number of things. Um, but that was a good point. So any final, we are coming to the end, and if people have seen me facilitate before, it's a, I like that we finish on time, but that's when we said we're gonna finish. So we have two more minutes. We can capture some more insights in the chat. We have more space. If anyone who's not spoken, who would like to say can something. I, can I speak, David? Yes, if I can see you, your hand's not up, but I, there yeah, you are. Me, I would like to say just uh, something like, um, in terms of you know having a plan, having a strategy, um, we all have worked like uh, quite hard to have what is here like online now. Um, I would like to thank like uh, the other OFN uh, representatives to, to have come in to share their, their their experience, and this is just to show like that. Well, first you don't need to be Irish, like I'm not to you know be part of this movement um you don't need to live in dublin and sometimes you don't even know that you are going to try and start a hub like i didn't know some months ago and now you know like i'm doing it and what we are i think asking all of you guys is if you think this has value if you think you would like to be a consumer or you would like to be a producer putting your products on such a platform come test it, join us, you know, like give us a hand, like I'm sure that we can make this happen, you know, much, much earlier than we would ever expect it before. Brilliant, Philippa, and that um, nicely segues into thanking. So Philippa is one of the steering committee. She's given her 50 euros on the Open Collective and has been working with the rest of the team. So thanks to everyone, uh, both on that core team and everyone on our Slack channel that was progressive. Tonight, thank you so much. Uh, it was lovely having those voices from Europe. So thanks, Raquel, Pau, and Fran, and Peter in Belfast there. Uh, as usual, thanks so much to Nick for giving his time so freely, uh, both here in the webinars, but in our Slack room, he's really quick to answer uh, or direct us to uh, a solution. Uh, so thanks, Nick. And, and definitely Yvonne and Floss to thank for, for sharing your stories and, and helping us see that. And most of all, thanks you, all of you, for bringing, not just coming for an hour and a half, but obviously you're here, so you're active, you're engaged somehow in your local communities. So thanks for that. We are going to cut now as a close, a final close. We're probably not going to disappear, um, so please use the chat. The chat will be saved. We'll stop recording now. Um, 
but just once again, thanks everyone involved tonight and thank you all for coming. Yay! Yay. <laughs>